Welcome to a Legendarium special about the Hungarian Peasants' Rebellion of 1514. In that year, a mass peasant uprising came close to sundering the Hungarian kingdom and called for abolishing the aristocracy 250 years before the French Revolution. During the reign of King Vladislas II from 1490 to 1516, royal power declined in favor of the aristocracy, who used their new power to exploit and oppress the peasants like never before. They took away traditional peasant rights to gather timber in the forest, graze animals on common pasture land, and made them spend more time working on the nobles' estates than their own farms. Hungary became a tinderbox of discontent, and a spark came when Cardinal Tamás Bakos called for volunteers to go on a crusade against the Turks on April 16th 1514. Grigori Doza, a Transylvanian man at arms, had gained great renown during Europe's on again off again war against Turkish expansion. The church placed Doza in charge of the coming crusade, and within a few weeks, Doza assembled an army of 40,000 men. Unfortunately, the government neglected to send weapons, armor, or even food. With nothing else to do, the vast assemblage of peasants began to air their many grievances against the nobles. And then, perhaps fearing what the crusading army might do, the Chancellor of Hungary commanded the peasants to return home for the hay harvest at the end of May. The peasant militias refused. In an attempt to force compliance, the lords and their retainers began terrorizing the peasants' wives and children back in the countryside. And as the situation escalated, Doza sided with the peasants and led them in an uprising. Despite King Vladislaus II threatening any peasant who failed to return home with death, the rebellion gained momentum fast. A radical priest named Lorenz Mazaros called for a war of extermination against the aristocracy more than 340 years before Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, and his peasant followers proved all too eager to obey their chief. The rebellion spread like wildfire through central Hungary. The poor townspeople of small cities like Arad, Lipa, and Buda rose up against those who called themselves their betters. The rulers tried to send knights against the rioters, but the rebels ambushed and unhorsed them as they passed through gates. Hundreds of manor houses went up in flames. Most peasant rebellions at the time committed violence against property, not persons. But when the rebels captured the aristocracy and gentry, they crucified them to trees and barn doors. When Doza seized the fortress of Sanad, he arrested the bishop and Castellan, impaling them through the bottom and up through the mouth, leaving them to die over a period of hours, if not days. Despite the rebels' early successes, the lords had money on their side, and they used it to hire mercenaries from Venice and Bohemia in the late summer of 1514. Doza's peasants were routed 18 miles from the capital, and this disaster was followed by a second defeat at Temesivar. After this battle, Doza was captured along with thousands of his followers. Doza was sentenced to sit upon a red-hot iron throne, his head encircled by a red-hot iron crown, a mockery of his supposed ambition to become a king. Before his execution, he swore that he would not scream in pain once. 
Yet he may have screamed in horror as 14 of his followers, who had been kept foodless for days, were ordered to tear pieces of roasting flesh from Doza's body and eat the flesh as he died. Men who ate Doza's flesh were spared by the authorities, while those who refused to do so died on the spot. One of the refuseniks who perished was Doza's younger brother. That winter, the Hungarian Diet of 1514 punished the peasant class for daring to defy them. By binding them to the soil, ordering them to work even more days for their lords, and they imposed heavy taxes upon them to pay for rebuilding Hungary after the uprising. Despite the cruel post-revolt order, Doza became a folk hero in Hungary, becoming the subject of poems and operas, and today his name is honored with street names and monuments across the country that he tried to liberate only 12 years after Columbus first sailed to the Americas. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.